I'm just going to be talking to you about the opportunity and the risk reward that I see in Ucro Capital. Um, a few disclosures before we start. I am invested. This is not a bio recommendation of any kind. And I'm not a SEBI registered analyst. So this is not a recommendation of any kind and just a discussion on the business as it is. So today, very quickly, I wanna talk about a few things surrounding the business. The first is that this is a business that has a large end market. And it's one that has showcased tremendous growth in the last few years. It's something that's built out of a differentiated lending model. Ugro is an NBFC and it lends to the MSME sector. So I'll talk today about why its lending model itself is different from other NBFCs and where it fits in. And more importantly, why FY23 and the year ahead is particularly important to the uh, thesis in Ugro and what we should expect. And the main risks that I wanna go over today is that its asset quality is unproven, which means uh, depending on the execution that it plays out on the downside, um, we have risks of not having a good book. But on the other side, the market may not recognize and assign it a particular multiple until this company has shown what its asset quality is like. The second risk associated with it is low ROEs. And I just wanna go over these five things. Please keep that in mind. So whenever we think of an NBFC or a lender, there are three particular pillars or lens through which we should ask questions about the business, right? On one side, we have the customer facing side, which is its disbursals, its acquisition, customer acquisitions and uh, turnaround times. The second is once it's got an asset on its books, how, or how, it, how is it able to differentiate between a good uh, person to lend to and a bad one, namely the underwriting. And finally, how is it doing with uh, receiving payments from the people that it's lent to? Okay, so I'm just gonna be walking you through these three sides of your gross business. And to start with, the whole reason that I said it's a lender with a differentiated business model comes down to something known as co-lending. And for people who haven't heard about this model before, the idea is that traditionally banks, uh, sorry, NBFCs, which don't have the same access to capital, cheap capital that banks do, right? They lend at a rate of, let's say eight or 9% from banks. And then they lend the same amount to other clients and make their profits on the spreads, right? This model, on the other hand, is something completely different. The idea here is that the RBI wanted to bridge a huge credit gap between um, the demand that the MSME sector in India has and the access that they have to formal credit. So this model in particular, okay, allows NBFCs to take on 20% of the loans that they disburse onto their books and actually pass 80% of these to banks. Okay, and charge a small fee on the amount that they sell to these banks. So the reason co-lending is important is for three different reasons. The first is that banks get to reach an, a market that they traditionally can't reach. They don't have the reach to find MSMEs. And even when they do, they find it difficult to separate good clients from bad. Right? That's the first advantage. The second thing that's truly important for us here is that this particular model generates more ROE than traditional lending models. And this is something that we should spend a little bit of time to understand why. Why is this the case? In traditional lending, if you had an NBFC that disbursed 100 crores of loans, they would require by RBI norms to have about 20 crores of equity capital in order to disburse that 100 crores of loans. Whereas with co-lending, for 100 crores of loans that they pass on, only uh, 20% of what they have is on the book, which means the equity capital that they need to have is actually on 20 crores of the loans for each 100 crores that they disperse. And the end result of this is that this is incredibly um, accretive for the ROEs. When so this slide here, this is full credit to Go India stocks. Um, they had a write up on how um, the ROE tree could look for NBFCs that take on co lending. 
And because the number of loans that you can disburse on the same equity capital is higher, this has a huge amount of uh, difference to the ROEs that NBFCs can do. So the thing that becomes important for an NBFC that takes on co-lending is that the higher amount of your book uh, that comes under co-lending, the larger the ROE that you can generate. So in this particular table, as you can see going down, um, as your co-lending proportion of your book increases, no matter what your loan yields are, whether they're 12% or 14%, any NBFC, for example, that puts out 70% of its book under co-lending can generate ROEs of 24%. So this is the bit that ties to what I told you earlier, that traditional models of lending require NBFCs to generate loan yields, right? And play the difference between their cost of funds and the yields that they generate through selling their products and selling out loans. But here, crucially, the yields of your loans don't matter as much, but for you to generate traditionally good ROE metrics, what's more important is that you disburse more loans through the co-lending model. So this is the first thing that's, it's truly remarkable. And the point I wanna make right now is that we're very early in India um, on this landscape. So currently today, this was um, introduced in 2018, and then again further in 2020 for uh, housing companies. Okay, someone has a hand raised. We can go through a question right now. Hey, this is Vijay. Quick question. Again, uh, how is it different from securitization that happened in the US? In what way? In 2008, we had securitization of home loans, right? Yeah. This is just target audiences, MSME segment, but it is having characteristics of securitization, right? Yeah, so the what you're absolutely right on here is that what ultimately matters in this case is the um, underwriting for the particular NBFC becomes paramount and super important. If their underwriting models aren't great, um, loans that they pass on to banks may not have the same rating as you saw in, let's say, 2008. But the key difference here is without co-lending, uh, the landscape to reach the MSME sector is particularly difficult. Why? Because NBFCs in general, while they want to disperse money to them, they don't have enough uh, credit and capital to reach them. So this mm -hmm. is the point that's being made here. Okay. And uh, as you've mentioned, the underwriting is extremely okay. important. Okay. Uh, I have a follow-up question. You don't need to answer this. We can continue the presentation. But there were two institutions in India called SIDBI, Small Industrial Development Bank of India, okay. and IDBI. It's Industrial Development Bank of India. If you see their history, their recovery from their lending has been very poor. This is just a caveat. Huh? I agree. I mean, um, I think, however, that the points that you mention are no different from uh, traditional lending models to co-lending here. That even if you have an NBFC that um, passes on loans, for example, or carries loans on its own books, having bad underwriting and bad collections generally will bankrupt the bank. So the, uh, the yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. What I'm trying to imply is uh, the moral dilemma here is this company can start dispersing as long as they can give the risk away to the banks. That's what I mean, right? Okay. Yeah. So this company has limited risk, but eventually the risk underwriters are the banks. That's so, true. That's true. And the, I think the RBI has introduced checks for this. The first of these is that um, banks also go through the asset pool um, before they take on the loan. They have the right to reject any bundle of loans that are given to them. The third is that um, uh, the third caveat that they have here is they also need to uh, agree on an underwriting method with these NBFCs before they disburse these loans. And there's a whole bunch of different checks. So, uh, yeah. Do you do you have a list of banks that these guys are actually operating with? Yes. And let's go to that right now. So, uh, the point that I was making earlier was that... Um, Sorry for my... Can you go back to the banks? I'm, I'm coming to that next, but I just want to make a quick point before we move to the banks. The idea here is that we need to be uh, looking for any kind of co-lending proportion above 30% for us to generate any meaningful ROEs from the market. Okay, here are the banks currently that have co-lending deals with Ucro. 
So primarily, I think the largest name on this list right now is SBI, right? Apart from them, Bank of Baroda, IDBI, as you said, Central Bank of India, and Indian Overseas Bank all have co-lending agreements with Ucro Capital at the moment. And the point that I want to make as well is they're currently in, eight, in 18 active discussions um, seen below here with PSU banks, private banks, and NBFCs as well. Do you have any questions on yeah. this? Why is, it, why, is, why is this only with public sector banks and not private sector? Okay, great question. And the answer is that the RBI has been pushing for uh, PSU banks to lead the way with co-lending. So that's been the landscape in the beginning that if you listen to con calls from SPI and from Bank of Baroda, they have been the ones to start uh, taking up co-lending. But the argument is not that it's only PSU banks at the moment that are taking it up. If you go through either annual reports or con calls from HDFC, Axis, all of them are talking about looking at co-lending to drive growth in the SME sector. And that's seen here as well, that Ugro is in discussion with six private banks, but it's true that currently the PSUs are the ones that are leading the... Yeah, forum. that's good actually for the country, but I do want to highlight a few of these banks did face some fraudulent issues in the recent past, especially IDBI, yeah. Bank of Baroda, right? So yeah. uh, what I'm trying to say is this takes away the moral dilemma of who holds bag of shit when things go south. So I would like to see how the promoters are linked or how are they cracking this deal with uh, these banks, public sector banks, right? Uh, yes. If these guys have big loan books with one or two of these banks, I would go short on, let's say, IDBI and go along on this company. Okay. <laughs> Uh, one uh, question on on this good trading strategy, by the way, Vijay. Uh, we don't have longer term options, otherwise it would have been so easy. Uh, one question, uh, are these most of these school lending uh, categorized in the PSL loans? Priority sector loans, yes, they are. Achha. So basically, it's a, uh, they have to meet their uh, regulatory requirements of a certain percentage in PSL loans, and they're just out, they don't want to build their own capabilities. Uh, and they just so, want to outsource yeah. it to a third party. Yeah, that's right. In uh, the public sector. But um, yeah, I think we can go over commentary made by different different banks. But I think we'll get to that uh, after we discuss the company. Because I think it's important. But we'll get to that. Okay. So I think moving on to the next part of uh, this bit. So the way Ugros arrived at um, understanding which people to lend to is threefold. So what they did was they worked with Crystal and looked through all of the um, MSMEs that fell into their sector. And as the image suggests, they worked with them to identify 20 sectors within the MSME space to lend to and finalize nine that they think offer the least amount of risk in terms of their cash flows and therefore uh, should provide better asset quality. So this is the first check that management has done. That they said, we're not just lending to MSMEs randomly, but they have a method of choosing nine particular sectors. And these include things like uh, chemical companies, um, education, uh, schools, for example, and uh, people that use machinery to uh, yeah, expand, for example. So there are nine key sectors. And the second thing that they did after arriving at these nine key sectors is they have a data model. Okay, and the data model works twofold. The first is that they use data from um, banking history for their clients. And they look at things like transaction frequency, how, what kind of savings or amount of money is left in the bank for any given time period. And through that, they build a model that spits out um, a score for what their uh, credibility will be based on these things. So they use three bits of data. One is GST data, the second is bureau, and the third is with the bank. And they've come up with the scorecard list. And the second thing that they've done is on a higher level for each of these things. For example, if you're looking at a school, they come up with a second scorecard in terms of like the vintage of the school, the kind of students and the profile that they have to arrive at a secondary scorecard for the particular clients that they take on, okay? And what they did was in Q4's con call, 
they've presented a proof of concept for their underwriting mechanism. So this is something I actually asked them on the con call. And the point that I made earlier was, for example, in the West, this is not something new that you grow alone is doing. I think there's a branch of SBI that also works on underwriting and creating a scorecard. Um, in the West, all big banks also come up with underwriting based on similar models that they make. And the problem they had was their particular rules that they implement in terms of customer behavior feeds into a rule-based system for in their machine learning models. And that rule needs to constantly be updated. Otherwise, the performance of their model fails. And what Ugro's management told me is that they've studied this for the last three or four years, and their model currently works in a way that they can um, they need to update their rules once every two years. Like the rule maintains performance for their model roughly for about two years. So what they've done is that for any particular customer that they want to lend to, they band them into the different scores and they focus on those that have a score range of A, B, and C. And that you can see on the table on the right. Like while they have um, different scores in particular, the people that they disperse the most to are in the prime A and B bracket. And what they claim is based on data that they've taken, that the people that they lend to, they can differentiate people from those that don't pay at the end of three and six months. So this is the management's claim on their method of underwriting. So to summarize what they've done, they've looked across the MSME pool, they have filtered nine sectors and they've gone further to say, okay, where in India do these have major hubs that we should target and open up branches? And let's say for automobiles, should we be targeting a particular uh, place in India? If it's a chemical company, should we be looking at the hedge, for example? And once they arrived at you know, a smart uh, way of understanding where to look, they developed a scorecard, which they claim works. And full caveat at this point of time, um, as of now, I'll go through their uh, asset quality right now, but the main risk that we have right now with Ugro is that they've not proven themselves over multiple economic cycles. So this is the first key risk that we see here, that they have a method. The argument as investors that we need to make is not that this is, you know, this is the best possible method out there. They don't need to be uh, doing that. The question you have to ask is whether this is good enough to maintain the asset quality that they guide for. So moving on from this, what I wanted to discuss is Vendis, for example, put out a very nice report on the MSME lending landscape. And here they've also shown where Ugro falls amongst the different players that are present in this sector. So Ugro in particular looks for, I think about 60% of their portfolio is uh, securitized and their ticket size is slightly higher than what other people aim for. So they're here in this particular range. And now I want to move to the next part of, um, you know, the business model, which is if they've underwritten their loans. And I think this is something that there's a lot to discuss about where I think currently with the country, um, I think this is something that you, a company in particular needs to earn trust for because of the evergreening of loans that has happened in the past. So I think one thing that I'm monitoring right now is just the, uh, collection efficiency. And what they've done is in the last six months, for example, they've given the data from 2019, but it's broken up into different segments. And in particular, they've, uh, I mean, in their disclosures from 2019 to 20, they broke up their collection efficiency in one way, then changed uh, their split from securitized to unsecuritized to the different channels that they lent through. And then finally started giving collection efficiencies on an overall a consolidated note. So I've just shown you the last 12 months and they've maintained about 94%. And the percentage of the book that they've currently got that's stressed is uh, between 17 to 2.3%. And in Q4, for example, there was a, um, a circular put out by RBI, which I think for many of you that follow NBFCs, there was a circular on recognizing stage three assets where they had to uh, reclassify what counted as a non-performing asset. And so because of that, a, a large number of NBFCs moved a portion of their stage two book into stage three. But in general, you grow so far till date has maintained um, a stage three of about 2%. 
And what I've noticed with the management so far is when in the last year during COVID, when we saw the second wave come in, they almost stopped dispersals altogether. So they'd halted it. They'd been prudent with their um, growth strategy, and they've always provisioned little more than what's been required by the uh, RBI. You can see that in the slide below. I think they provisioned 40 crores versus the regulatory requirement of 27.2. So what I've seen so far, they've uh, they've been prudent with their strategy. Lastly, again, credits to vendors. Um, they've put out a nice comparison of where they expect credit costs to be across asset classes. And in general, for secured SME loans, we should be expecting um, credit costs of between 2 to 2.5%. But I think in the last year in COVID, this was particularly stressed. So as of now, the data tells us that they're not doing fantastically better than you know, what would be expected. But this is something to monitor as the portfolio seasons and the uh, clients that they have go further and further into their tenure, which is roughly between one and three years. Okay, so moving forward, something else that I'd like to highlight, which stood out to me with the book, is usually lenders have a reliance on one particular state, right? And for them to move across geographies has been difficult and not always successful. So something that stood out to me with Ugro, for example, is that from the get-go, they've been diversified with their uh, geography mix, and there's not one particular state that contributes a large amount to the uh, overall buy. And the same thing is true of the sector mix. So that's what you can see here. So the story so far on operating and financial metrics is one of growth, where they've scaled up their AOM tremendously from about 1,300 crores last year to currently it's over 3,000. And so far they've maintained their NPAs in the two to 2.5% range. This is where we are. But what I can, I being completely honest with you, this is not a reason that, you know, the NPAs will remain low in the future. All we know right now is so far in the last two years, they've maintained asset quality. And this is something that we have to, um, monitor. Why do I say that FY23 is an inflection point? Well, the first is that they've guided for their off-book AUM to scale tremendously from the 16% that it is right now to 35% in FY23. So from the discussion that we had earlier on ROEs, we should expect that this first particular point should generate better ROEs than we've seen so far in FY22. The second thing that I'd like to highlight is in the Q4 con call, they had mentioned that so far they've spent a large amount of their money on OPEX. And that's a contributing factor to the ROA being low. And they've scaled their branches from about 10 to 100 in the last year. They've said this is enough for the next year and a half, so to speak. So already in Q1, we're expecting a cost to income of about 63%, which is 10% lower than what we saw in Q4. So putting these two together, if this company can manage to scale up their off-book AUM, I'm ignoring their AUM guidance here, right? But if we just focus on the amount of loans that they disburse through co-lending, and if it's higher than 16%, and they can bring, bring down their OPEX, I'm confident that this company should see ROE expansion in FY23, as well as um, generate better profits than it has in FY23. So this is why I think FY23 in particular is an inflection point. The growth, while it seems alarming, if 50% of the uh, growth is off book and they can maintain good standards with their underwriting, this is not as alarming because uh, as we had discussed earlier on the same equity capital, you can disperse uh, more loans. So on book, they're only looking to have about 10,000 crores. Um, lastly, what I wanna share with their with something that I noticed was their very first presentation that they put out in 2019. Um, they only had seven branches and they said like, you know, if things go well in five years, we should have about 27. They've actually managed to put out 91 branches today. They've hit their target of meeting 12 states and currently they work with 55 lenders. And um, in 2019, they had said that they'd like to have between 10 and 15 co-lending partners. Today we're at five with 18 active discussions. So this is where we stand. And these are the things that I'm monitoring. At this point, I'm happy to take questions and discuss. I am invested in bias, but I think um, 
yeah, I think the major risks that we see right now are that A, the underwriting has to be seen across a multiple you know, economic cycles and may either fall apart or the market may not reward you as an investment until this company can prove itself. And yeah, thank you. I have a few questions. I do. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Harsh. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I have a few questions. Uh, I saw like the CEO resigned last year. Also, the promoters have been selling. Uh, I think they are probably partly funded by private equity. But like, yeah. who is running the show? Like, who is this person who is building the team? Okay, so I want to, I can go over that if we have time, because I think there's a large story to tell, but the person who, okay, so the way the equity structure works, and if, if I can give you the story quickly in a few minutes, um, the story starts actually with Religare. And the point is the current uh, person who's running the show at Ugro is a man named uh, Sachindranath. Okay, and he was actually uh, the group CEO of Religare. Um, between 2009 and 2014. And Religare is famous because the Ranbaxy brothers had uh, pulled off an enormous scam with Religare. They had stolen about 2,500 crores of shareholder money. And the current CEO actually quit Religare two years before the scandal came to light. And he said uh, he cited co corporate governance problems. And he had overseen Religare growth's book from uh, like a small fledgling company to actually what you grow is guided of 20,000 crores. But he left the company despite being the head and despite growing it, saying their corporate government's issues and decided to start his own business. And there's a lot to say here where um, the structures that have been put in place at Ugro have been designed in a way that the problems that happened at Religare can't happen here. And that's the person who's running the show. So he went to private equity uh, partners in 2018. They raised about a thousand crores in capital. And he didn't want to uh, arrive at a story where, you know, after investing, they're looking for an exit. So they decided to buy a listed entity in 2018. So Ugro was actually uh, a company called Chokhani Securities that him and the equity partners bought out in 2018. He owns about 2.8% of the company and uh, these... No, hang on. The private equity partners own uh, roughly 69% of it. So together between all of them, it was about 72% of the buy. How is this guy incentivized? Like, uh, does he have large ESOP pools? Because why would he be doing it for 2% equity or 2 or 3%? Uh, do you know like, if, they, if he has large I know they, they do have an ESOP scheme. Um, but apart from that, um, yeah. No, yeah, I think I can give you that answer. That there is, I, I do believe there's an ESOP scheme, but he does own 3% of the buy. And I think you showed on one of the slides about collection efficiency, which has been kind of maintained around 94% in the last 12 months. In yeah. that case, if the collection efficiency over a one year period is, let's say 94, 93%, then how can the stress pool be only 2%? Like this would imply that the stress pool is probably more than five 5%. or six percent. That's a good question. Uh, uh, have you uh, thought about it, or uh, I have thought about of, that before? These kinds of details are generally provided in securitization documents. So basically, what they are doing is they are acting as a broker. They are underwriting for different people, and they are putting That's up right. a small risk capital. So generally, when they securitize these documents, these have to be rated by, let's say, a Presil. Uh, or a care or a ikra or a smera or anyone they have and, and over, that's and, true yeah and over there you'll find you'll be able to find uh like for the securitization pool what is the delinquency so maybe the company doesn't report it but if you read the securitization documents you will have the uh, stress pool because it doesn't like if uh, you have been not collecting six or seven percent of your loans for the last year yeah. how can stress be only two percent Okay, great point. I'll go look at it. What What is true is I've seen the pools that they do pass on. Uh, they uh, they have had them rated by, I think, ICRA. And there, there are also like various provisions for the amount of money that they lend. So Ugro, for example, um, when it raises capital from, let's say, debentures, they've associated a lo particular loan pool to that debenture and also put in 
automatic exit clauses. So for example, if the NPAs rise above 4% for more than six months in a year, there's automatically a third party which gains ownership of uh, a pool to liquidate that and uh, return money to the people that have yeah, bought in. And generally these documents, the rating is supposed to uh, uh, be cut on a continuous basis. So every six months or eight months, yeah. they are supposed to tell how much of the pool is under stress. So they give, give these statistics, which can be useful to under. Also, most of the companies, they securitize the nicer part of the pool uh, yeah. because that number comes out uh, for everyone. Okay. Another question that I had was, it seems that all the institutions have been exiting uh, in the last year or so, like both the FIIs, DIIs, like it seems that, yeah, they are, everyone is telling the story. Like what is it that others are seeing? Okay, so I can give you two answers for that. The first is one uh, person who made an exit was uh, Sunil Sanghanyan's fund. Like they had bought in, in 2018. And the answer that management gave us is that they usually have a lock-in period of, I think four years or three years. And the answer that they gave us when we asked them the question was that, by their funds rules, they're not allowed to hold something longer. And that's something that we can chase up and ask. But I haven't had an opportunity to uh, verify if that's true, but I looked across um, Mr. Singhania's holdings and I believe that I couldn't see something that lasted long at the time that I'd done this. The second point to make is this, that the share price to where it trades at today is roughly the same price that these private equity people bought it for in 2018. So they bought it for about 134 rupees a share. And that was disclosed in one of the interviews that he had given. So I think um, my answer is that for some of them, they've had varying lock-in periods. And one particular investor um, decided to sell about 10% of their uh, holdings in the business. So that's how it went from about 80% owned to about 72%. But I think the others are um, have been on board and are board members according to their positions. That includes, I think, ADV partners, the Himatsinka family, and a bunch of others as well. So it's not that everyone has been selling, it's two in particular, one Mr. Singhania's fund and another whose lock-in period expired. And I think when he answered this, he said, this is why they chose a listed entity, that people can sell without the need of, you know, thinking of an IPO or thinking of an exit in that case. Uh, any other questions? I think I have one last one. How yeah. would you value these kinds of companies? So this is not a conventional bank where you can trust the ROEs. This is a distribution model. So distribution by principle will have higher ROEs, right? Like if you look at uh, any broking company, for example, yeah. which can be a broker for anything, they'll have high ROEs. Uh, but then the profit pool kind of is not that big. If you're in, into lending, maybe your ROEs are not that high, but the absolute size of profits which you can make can be huge. Uh, so how would you kind of value uh, value you could? I've thought about this and I think there are two answers. The first is I was thinking of whether one should apply like a sum of the parts to the business where you have a piece that's on book and a piece that's off book. Problem with that is the piece that's on book will always have or deserve lower multiples because uh, their NIMs are about six or seven percent. So if you were to value the on book part of the loans, it's not as large as traditional lenders. Um, I think if the way they work is lending as a service, then um, I think PE might actually be a good way of arriving at a valuation for them. Are there any global benchmarks? Are there any global peers for this Yes, company? okay, there are. I think there are two or three. First, um, even before going to global peers, there are two in the domestic space. One is mass financials. And that's actually a way of playing the same uh, trends in India of co-lending. Uh, without the same, without the risk perhaps that you're growing. So that was the second company that I thought I can just run by you guys. Um, they're also in the co-lending space, but they've had a track record for longer of higher ROEs. Second um, company in India that's working in the co-lending space, there's um, Edelweiss, there's IFL Housing. There's also Capri Global, which is a company that works with co-lending. And I think the market has given that like a book multiple of about five, five or six times. So I think it's a new landscape one has to see. I think PE might be the way forward more than book. Uh, global peers, there's one, it's called Cabbage. I thought the management was joking when they said it, but there's a global company called Cabbage, which deals with something like this. 
And what are the multiples? Uh, is it a traded company, Savage? I don't think so. That's the last time I looked and I tried to study. Um, I wasn't able to find. I think in India, there's one that's also unlisted, but I'm not happy with them. I think it's called Cred Avenue, mm -hmm. which is another one that's in, in uh, co-lending. Okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, and I let others also yeah, ask yeah. questions. Okay. Uh, I Someone else had their hand raised. Prabhu. Uh, hi. Um, uh, good work. Thanks for sharing, actually. Um, I don't want to first go into the... <clears throat> details, but I just want to ask a little bit more perspective. If it is such a ROE, a creative model, what stops from others to copying? Yeah, good question. Um, shall I stop sharing my screen so we can just uh, speak to each other? Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, from what I've understood in the landscape, I can, I can share two or three things. The first is um, the way I've been tracking the space is there's a particular forum called Resurgent India. And what they do is that they've they've been on top of co-lending in the landscape and how it's evolving. And they bring on people from SBI, uh, you know, Union Bank of India and different people to talk about why they're pursuing this, what challenges they've faced and the experiences with companies like this. And they've also brought on uh, companies like Ugro. There's also one called Dhanvarsha Capital that's also in the co-lending space. But whenever I've listened to them, it's clear, um, at least from their body language and the way they talk, that Ugro is seen as someone who's the first mover and an expert. And so because it's ROE creative, what, what you've said is absolutely right, that um, from what I've read in the industry, we expect yields actually to fall with time. So as more and more people take on uh, something like co-lending, the yields may fall from, let's say, 14% to gradually lower and lower. But at the moment, the, okay, the, the main advantage that these people have right now is Ugro built its co-lending model in 2019. It's taken three years to come to terms with the um, banks and NBFCs on, on basically arriving at um, NPA recognition, arriving at a product that they actually lend to, the kind of customer that they lend to. So Ugro talks a lot about this on those forums that, I mean, lending to uh, machinery finance, for example, in their sectors is something that banks are not very familiar with. So the question has been for them a back and forth between do they want to change their target profile to meet banks halfway or can they convince banks to lend to the kind of clients that they've identified? And so far it's been slow, but from management commentary and from these um, you know, resurgent India forums, they are all hopeful that you know, from norms that the RBI is introducing that uptake will be progressively faster and faster in the next few years. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I switched off. I didn't realize we are still recording. So, <laughs> so I had to switch on my background. Um, okay. uh, the other question is that like, so for example, um, you know, since it's gonna be the lenders or, or I mean that the borrowers are not normally would credit, get credit from the banks. You know, we all spoke about mudra loans, for example, like a few years ago, it was all about mudra loans. Now, no one is speaking about it. No, no one even knows what happened to them. So, I mean, that's just an immediate um, example that we have in hand, um, which could, uh, which is, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Maybe the economy will, will improve. That's number two. And, and before you answer that, I also, if you look at the lending pattern or the, the amount of, um, I mean, the contribution from each state, it perfectly matches with the GDP of the each states. Like South has really, so it, it's, it's completely uh, connected to the GDP growth, in my opinion. I mean, the growth. Great point. Of, yeah, nice, the, nice observation. So the macro point of view has to be taken care. I mean, looked into if you want to, how much we're going to grow next year. I think that will probably match with the growth. Of course, of course, there are some, X factors like uh, co-lending and stuff like that. But uh, so, I mean, I don't know what you expect from next year, uh, two things, how much India would grow. I mean, that's number two. And also is that like, what, what do you, how do you uh, think about mudra loans, especially given that borrowers are not, you know, like the normal ones. Okay, um, taking that point by point, I think, I mean, we can look at the figures for India's GDP growth. Uh, but I think here, in particular, since Ugro is a new company which is expanding branches, it's likelier that partnerships that it forms and the branch expansions that it does will 
drive growth in those sectors compared to you grow. But you've actually raised an important point that for me as an investor, I'm looking forward to this particular credit cycle right now because it'll shed light on the book and the quality of the book. And we'll get data on both fronts. Like if the macro scenario is difficult for uh, the MSME sector, it'll tell me immediately that, okay, whether the stress pool goes up or not gives me data to understand how they perform. So uh, that's why I started off by telling you the risk right now is that we we don't know how they will perform. And this will be one important data. On the e-mudra loans, that's not something that I'm familiar with. So I don't want to give you an answer without uh, of one that I don't know. What I can tell you is I've just been following commentary from uh, PSU banks, from uh, forums like this where people are talking about it. We don't know. We don't know if uh, co-lending will uh, pick up or not. But based on recent uh, developments with the RBI, including I think last week there was a push by uh, I think a finance minister telling PSU banks to onboard account aggregators. I think there are, I mean, the industry is moving towards uh, it being likelier that there's a pickup in co-lending than not. But that's something to be seen through FY23. Just one more last thing is that uh, their scoring is, is that based on ML model or something? Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you know if any ML model that worked well for lending, you know, like so far, I mean, that's also gives me some nervousness. You know what I mean? Like, uh, no, we are. I think, I mean, if you look abroad, there have been successful uh, machine learning models that are able to differentiate to some degree between uh, good customers and bad. But I think, so to me, as an investor, the point was that I think uh, we have to just argue that what they're doing is better than currently existing standards. Like if you can do without machine learning and disburse loans in a particular format, if they, if you can apply a smarter mechanism that something that generates, let's say, 2% of a stressed pool, that's positive for me. But there's no way we can tell from now. And I keep, I mean, in every con call, whenever management brings this up, there's something that we can go through. But what they've done is they've posted case studies of different, different kinds through all of their um, investor presentations from Q4, like FY 2019, to uh, where we are today. So we can go through different, different uh, case studies there to see how they've uh, built something. And yeah, that's open for Right. I mean, it's almost like back test, right? You always know. No, 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 no. I don't mean it's back test. I'm saying in, in every um, presentation that they've put out, they've given us an interesting case study of something that they've done at that point in time. So if you scroll back on their website to FY19, they've given two case studies on um, the way they, what they look for in lending to one of the nine subsectors, for example, like, from 2019, I remember one on the chemical sector. I think in 2021, there was a case study on education loans. So I, I think I can collate that and we can discuss. Um, maybe in another time, I'll prepare a list of what they've done. But yeah, I, I think mean, this, sure. is, this is an answer I don't have. I wish I had data to tell you that well, sure. you know, I this mean, is I... how they've performed across X cycles. The problem we have right now is measuring probability of, of them doing well. No, I, I'm not sorry. I'm not saying. Uh, I'm just saying. Give you the caveats, stuff. and that. That's I agree. All. I agree. I'm on the same that's page. All the questions I have. Yeah. Can I go next? Please. Hey. Uh, to be honest, nice presentation. You took the story through in a very logical manner. Uh, great uh, presentation, for a fact, right? Now, I do have a few concerns on the business itself, right? Okay. Um, it's not about um, the co-lending, the machine learning, all the fancy words that we are talking about now, but rather it's a simple, very simple approach. I'm a very simple guy. I don't understand complexity. So first, I want to understand, or I need to dig deeper, uh, what is the concentration of customers that they're lending to? probably one or two of regional uh, companies in, in, let's say, South India, who did they lend to? If I can get that, probably I can judge them. But I can are... give you that data immediately. So okay. I have that data. There's, a, I think, a site called Zauba Corp, yeah. which lists charges that companies have made. So I have a list of all every single one that they've registered with them. So that we can yeah. go through. Yeah, perfect. That's good. And second thing, is the PSU lending model, right? Uh, my dad 
worked in IDBI for 32 years as a loan recovery agent. Vijay, uh, just uh, we are still recording. So yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's no fine. problem. Uh, and our my dad's job was to actually recover, uh, you know, loans which were delinquent. Yeah, and it's IDBI. It is. It was set up by government of India to actually give out loans to industries uh, as part of, let's say, uh, incentivizing industrial growth. And after the 90s, it became uh, predominant in lending. And they also created another institution called Small Banking, Industrial Banking uh, Development Bank or whatever. It's called SIDBI. Yeah? Yeah. And personally, my dad got at least two or three death threats over his career. So what this shows is lending is a hard business. Uh, and if public sector banks are uh, the main underwriters of these loans, I would not be very confident in investing uh, in such businesses because their controls are very, how can I say, they've improved over the years, but they're not to the standards of a private sector bank, right? The minute a private sector bank signs up, then I would be a little bit more comfortable looking into this business. I can give you two things very quickly before I move on. I'd actually love to talk to you about um, this. So on the first point, um, it's Ugro that's underwriting and they sell the loans, 80% of these loans to the banks and the risk is shared in an 80-20 manner. So it's Ugro's underwriting, it's IDBI's capital. If, if that puts it to any ease. The second thing to say is that Ugro has an agreement with ICICI Bank. Um, um, how much ICICI Bank is uh, funding their loans? So, what is the okay. scale? so just talking about that very quickly, the idea was that they've signed in principle an agreement to discuss co-lending and they signed that in 2019 with ICICI. Currently, they've not arrived at a product and not agreed on underwriting norms. So it's still... Um, work in progress, but they this they disclose that they're working with ICICI well in in like 2019. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, again, uh, I have an issue also with their growth strategy. Right, the thing is, they said that we'll grow at 22, 27 uh, branches for next two years, three years, and they suddenly uh, they grew moved to massively. Yeah. The problem is during a crisis period like COVID, capital is of high demand. Right. So here we are in a business of lending money. Money is your so-called asset, right? Your your. Yeah. Uh, uh, then there are always a lot of takers during a crisis period to actually take uh, take money out of you, right? So I wouldn't take that growth as a benchmark. Rather, let them see how this capital cycle flows. Yeah. Right now, there is interest rate tightening across the world. Private equity players will exit because they want a dollar denominated return and so on. Let them go through this cycle, and then probably it's worth looking at maybe next early next year after at least one or two capital uh, uh, rate hikes. Right. Yeah. So, I agree with you. I think this is um, exactly my thought process and why I said to me, I'm looking forward to FY23 either to make the thesis or break it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In particular, I, I just wanted to say that like while they've been around since 2019, uh, they spent the first year and a half after getting the capital infusion just to build their technology model and uh, build this side. So during COVID, they actually worked on improving their tech and they didn't uh, disperse as much. And I can show you that there's actually more, um, which gives me confidence. If I can just share a slide from their mm -hmm. presentation, it's in a different sheet. So just give me one moment to pull that up. Uh, and I hope this also, it gave me confidence uh, to some degree. And I'd like to share that with, with yeah. you. Okay. Uh, it's about that board. I think they've really, really done well with that. So I'll just show you that and you can tell me your thoughts on. I mean, my thoughts is irrelevant, right? Uh, it's just, uh, is it a good idea for my portfolio? That's how I look at things. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Yeah, I can. Yeah, again. Is oh, it still seeing it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know this guy. Shit. Which one do you know? 
the first guy okay so the things bad things i mean he was in idbi or let's say it was part of the setting up of sidb right so yeah i can talk i'll find my dad and get the connection again and have a discussion with him but yeah i i know one person at least the first one okay so this is the board at the moment and these are the people from uh the private equity backers they've got people from sebi rbi uh x lic and sidb as you said and their management team is here so the reason that i liked them in the first place was uh these people who worked with him a part of them were involved in setting up uh relegar so even though there was a scandal at the top this guy wasn't named in any of the investigations he wasn't named in any of the court documents and he left and set this up saying they ruined what he had built earlier so even though the on paper the aum does seem like a tremendous amount of growth in a short period of time he has been responsible in growing the book to that scale before so this is the second time he's done it that's something that also gives me some confidence it's not people who you know doing this for the first time uh these are the people that we have and it's not often that you get a board with this kind of experience on a company that's um you know with this lower market cap i mean um, these all of these people are board members or these guys are these executive are the committee team. yeah, yeah. okay this is the management the, team. the previous slide was the board members right yeah exactly um and i think their experience was given in a different thing they didn't um no no that's it. fine uh, the reason is uh, i just wanted to make sure that uh, we don't have a very large manage um, board of directors right yeah it's never it never works if you have more than handful the other thing i think i'd like to point out and i think someone had raised the point that um uh sorry, let me just quickly see if i can find that if not i'll share that in a different uh this is the point about them not dispersing as much someone had asked about their cfo resigning last year and i believe i'm i have an answer for that so the okay so the first problem is that uh, they brought on people from relegar that decided they wanted to move to one guy had come from asset management to work with them on the nbfc and then decided to go back to his uh old profession the second thing is that i think there is some risk of keeping these people because i believe the remuneration that they give at the moment is very low like they're not paying them much at all so i think they followed this guy from uh, relegate where they are now and depending on how they scale up uh yeah it's a question whether they can keep them but let me just share i can share the governance slide if you'd like but do you have any more questions because i think harsh also wanted to present avanti and i've taken up quite a lot of time on this hey chinmay this is dinar here so i sorry i missed uh, your earlier part but what's the key differentiator like they're just focused on certain verticals a uh, key differentiator to me is first that they're focusing on co-lending where there aren't many in this landscape who made the move yeah uh, so they are the first movers right now and potentially can become india's largest co-lending platform based on how their discussions uh pan out second thing i said was that they have an underwriting system that's smart i don't claim that they have the best underwriting system because i think uh i think sbi also has one that's impressive but in general there has been a push at least in the west towards models that focus on machine learning so that's what i said is uh, differentiated and yeah i think the the point of my story is that they have aspirations but are yet unproven and there's nothing one can do or argue the only thing one can do is follow the data and give them time to to prove themselves there's nothing i can say there's nothing honestly i can point to a data that i can say that um shows that what they've done right now can sustain in the future so, so, so for example right india bulls also is in now into co lending um and yeah. they set up a platform with integrations with all these public sector utilities right so they they do the yeah the operational bits yeah but the capital comes from banks yeah but yeah. for india bulls i believe it's housing funds yeah yeah so, uh, yeah but all i'm saying is yeah uh, uh, and then it doesn't bajaj finance they won't do something similar or i think everyone i mean i i encourage you to go see from 
con calls, but most NBFCs have spoken about pursuing co-lending as a, a growth strategy going forward. So it depends on the end use. And uh, I haven't, to be honest, seen it from Bajaj Finance, but uh, there are a number of other NBFCs that have. Okay, very, very basic question. What's the difference between co-lending and securitization? Uh, I think they charge a fee on the 20% that goes. Um, have you, uh, we can walk through the, uh, what do you say, the, uh, the difference. But I think it's, it's the, there is a definite difference between let's say a direct assignment and one that falls through call. No, so yeah, I think I had the same question, but I think the way this works, this, the way securitization works is uh, the NBFC would have to uh, yeah, use its capital initially uh, build up a tranche and then securitize the tranche. Whereas the way co-lending works is they'll basically give the loan on behalf of HDFC or, or on behalf of SBI and work with, yeah. So it's from day one itself, they don't need to uh, invest capital, but they have to sort of adhere to norms of the co-lending partner. Yeah. So, so effectively they'll do all the paperwork but the credit approval also has to come from the co-lending partner. Okay, so just to follow up to that. So during the securitization era, there was also something called as direct assignment, which is what yeah. HDFC does for HDFC bank, right? Yeah. Uh, so before you don't need to put up all the capital and you just pass it on. So how would uh, direct assignment differ from co-lending? Uh, but in direct assignment, you don't share the loans at all, right? Uh, you just uh, sell yeah. loans to these banks and then you send off things. So here there's a shared, um, you're taking on 20% of the loan on your own book. So that's the incentive for the NBFC to also make sure that underwriting is all par. But I believe, um, actually to answer another question I think Vijay had is I believe Ugro is in talks right now on offering things like uh, FLDG in ways to ensure that people are happier with the product and understand the underwriting which is I think the first loan defaulter guarantee. Like they're looking at different, different ways of um, arriving at a good product with banks. But what I do is I'd like to share a summary at the end of this on, um, on all of the Resurgent India seminars that I've attended because they are the ones to listen to and listen to what the experts are saying. Um, but Harsh, please, I think I've taken up way too much time. I think you should talk about Avanti. Yeah, just final uh, thought process was like, so this seems to be very similar to what they did, what the government did in uh, infrastructure. So earlier there was a BOT model and then they came out with a HAM model uh, where the developer had a certain part of the equity, but NHGI also had a certain part. So I guess they are doing something uh, similar, but then the HAM model only took off for a couple of years and now everyone wants to go back to BOT. Can happen here as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I told you again, these are all early days in the industry. So I can't even point to it right now to say, here's a great success story. But FY23 again is the answer for some of this because uh, a number of the PSU banks are aiming at sailing this up. So we'll only have answers to these questions two years from now. The problem I have is if Ugro can prove its business model and underwriting quality, or at least maintain what they've had so far, I think the market will re-rate it far higher. So the Problem is if we wait to understand uh, what can happen, we may not get the company at the valuations it's trading at today. So that's so the risk. The valuation today? It's at book value. It's at book value, but if we value it on, P I think right now it makes sense valuing it on book value because it's um, most of the lending, 84% of the lending portfolio is on book. Um, but if they can bring down OPEX, I. I, my own personal expectation from FY23 is about a pat of between 45 and 60 crores, which means it's trading at a less than about a PE of 20 on a one-year forward basis. 